Scripture says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, and him here is the, the Antichrist, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who's been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone's destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Krypton is a fictional element from the planet in which Superman comes from. Because of that and because of the fact that the Earth's atmosphere and environment is unable to accommodate Krypton, it is the death blow to Superman. If Superman were to come in contact with any form of Krypton, he would lose his powers and it could even have devastating consequences to the environment of the Earth. In the early Superman comic books, Krypton was in fact a ruby color of red. That was too expensive to print, so they eventually switched it to a green color, which we know it today. Krypton, when it is part of the radon spectrum, when it comes into the earth, it takes the form of kryptonite and uh, it can devastate those who dwell on the earth. As I mentioned, it's fiction. Don't add this of things in your mind to worry about. <laughs> Does not exist. In fact, later on in the Superman series, they got tired of all the kryptonite story arcs and so they just kryptonized the entire earth to make the earth immune to Krypton so they could get out of that plot, out of that plot arc. Anyway. Uh, Superman gets devastated by kryptonite. The Antichrist in Revelation 13 is the most powerful person the earth has ever known. He has a capacity for evil that is unrivaled. He demands political power and receives leadership as the earth exalts him up. Every nation of the earth will bow their knee to him. Every tribe, every ethnic group, every language group, all will bow to the Antichrist. His authority and influence in the earth is unrivaled. Nevertheless, he's not omnipotent. He has his own kryptonite. He has his own thing that will bring him to his knees. The Antichrist can be, it seems, almost too powerful, but in the end, he is not powerful enough to overthrow God. Even his power has its limits. Even his reach has its bounds. He cannot reach, while he can reach all around the entire earth, he cannot overthrow God from his throne. We looked last week at the rise of the Antichrist and we saw that despite all the power the Antichrist has, he has some limitations. Last week we saw that the Antichrist is not free. He's not his own man. He is held under the power of Satan himself. The Antichrist is working for the dragon. He may seem to be the most powerful leader on the earth and yet he's not even in charge of his own life. Beyond that, we saw that the Antichrist, not only is he not free, he's not original. His best moves are ones he's imitating what the Lord has already done. He can work these powers and miracles and wonders, but they're all fake powers and fake miracles and fake wonders patterned after what our Lord himself did. The Antichrist's best guess, his best attempt, his highest reach is nothing more than a pale imitation of what our Lord has already done. And then third, we saw that the Antichrist is not sovereign. Everything he does, he does by the permissive will of God. It's God who allows him to reign on the earth for three and a half years. If God were to shorten the time or extend the time, the Antichrist would have to be subject to the will of the Lord. As despite the immense power he seems to have, he can only do what God allows him to do. He works for the devil. He's not original. And he most certainly is not sovereign. We drill down a little bit deeper here when we talk about the sovereignty of God, though, with these next three verses. And it really gets to the heart of the difference between the Antichrist and God himself. You know, despite the fact that God is original, that God is free, that God is sovereign, that just begins to scratch the surface of how he's different from the Antichrist. The main difference, the main way God distinguishes himself from the Antichrist is that God is a savior. God is a savior. God is a savior by nature. Sin is against God and God has designed a way to forgive sin. The Antichrist has no grid for that. The Antichrist is not capable of forgiving sin. He doesn't have the capacity to forgive sin. It wouldn't even occur to him to forgive sin. Sin is not against the Antichrist, it's against God. And so the Antichrist is not a savior. He does not have the power to change human hearts. He does not have the power to reconcile sinful man to righteous God. He can't do it. It's not in his ability. In contrast, God is a savior. 
God designed the world in such a way that he would reconcile sinful man to righteous God. In fact, if you remember, the reason that Satan himself with his demons rebelled against God is because they resented the fact that God made Adam and Eve, gave Adam and Eve dominion on the earth. The devil looked at Adam and Eve and saw how low they were and how frail they were and how fickle they were and couldn't believe that they were the ones who had dominion. And so the devil sought to tear them down to overthrow them so he could take control of the earth. And of course, this is the point in Hebrews chapter two that when the Lord Jesus comes, he doesn't come like an angel. He doesn't come as a spiritual being. He comes like a man in a form lower than the angels to reconcile God to man. He leads a sinless life so he can recognize or he can reconcile fallen man with righteous God because he himself was a man and he was God. The devil was neither. The Antichrist, despite his best attempts, has no capacity to reconcile sinful man with righteous God. That's the, the background of this three, these three precious verses right here, Revelation 13, 8 through 10. Let me give you an outline this morning. Five ways that you see the, the power of the gospel. Five truths that reveal the power of the gospel. Because God, because he's a savior, uses the gospel as the Antichrist kryptonite. The gospel is what will bring the Antichrist down. You see the limitations of the, go- the limitations of the Antichrist in contrast to the gospel. This seven-year reign of terror on the earth the Antichrist leads. It's the black background for the bright light of the gospel to shine. And you see five truths in these three verses here that demonstrate the power of the gospel. They're all in contrast with the Antichrist. They're all in contrast with him. We see the beauty of the gospel in these five ways. First, we see the condition that requires it, the condition that requires it. It's called depravity. And you see that in verse eight. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, him being the Antichrist. Now, first of all, we recognize that they're worshiping the Antichrist, but earlier in Revelation 13, it said they're really worshiping the dragon, the devil himself. They don't recognize that the Antichrist is subject to the devil. So as the earth begins to worship the Antichrist, they're in fact worshiping the devil himself. But notice the phrase here where John focuses is that all will worship him. Every individual on earth will worship the Antichrist and worship the devil. Now there's going to be an exception clause later on. We'll look at it at our second point. But for now, he's saying everybody on earth worships the Antichrist. Everyone. It's not a cultural thing. It's not an ethnic thing. It's not a political thing. It's not a language thing. Every nation, every tribe, every ethnic group will worship the Antichrist. Every individual will worship him. And it's not, listen carefully, it's not that those in the tribulation are more wicked people than you and I are. It's not that the evil in the tribulation will exceed the evil of our present day. Oh, we wouldn't worship the Antichrist, but those people over there, they're so wicked. Of course they would. The point here is that the evil that provokes a heart to worship the devil is in every one of our hearts. You would worship the Antichrist were you there if it were not for the rest of this passage. Do you understand that the human heart has the capacity for every kind of evil in it? It's very easy for you to look at people who are more wicked than you are. Your neighbor, your coworker, the person across the street, the person you read about in the newspaper. Oh man, those people are wicked. But your heart is capable of the exact same kind of evil. The only restraint on evil in your life is external to your heart. Your own self-control, the way you were raised, your fear of going to jail or whatever. That's what restrains evil in this world. It's not inside the human heart that restrains evil. The human heart is wicked and sinful. People are born into this world loving sin and running from God. That's called depravity. Our factory reset condition is loving sin. Out of the box, people come loving sin and running from God. Because of the fall of Adam into sin, every human being is born loving sin. And you can't change your own heart. The fall, the prevalence of sin. I don't even want to say the inclination to sin because that makes it sound like, you know, your heart could go either way. You're just kind of inclined to roll down the sinful side of the hill instead of the righteous side of the hill. It's not an inclination. It's a, it's a disposition. It's a love. It's an affection in your heart for sin. That's what causes you to sin. You don't come into this world with a blank slate. I've heard some people say, you know, people are born with just a a blank slate and you can draw on it whatever picture. This is why babies are so impressionable. You can draw on it whatever kind of picture you want. Make them into whatever kind of kid you want. Whoever said that never had a child. (laughs) 
how evil those little kids are. <laughs> and you're even worse <laughs> because you've had practice. You have the muscle to, uh, to do what they only want to do. You can act what's in your heart. That's every single human being. We're all born loving sin. We're all born fallen, fallen, fallen. You don't just miss God's holiness by 1%. You've fallen out of it. Like the demons cast down from heaven to earth. That's you fallen from the grace of God. You've fallen from your love of God. And when you're born, you're like that. And that depravity affects every part of your heart. Every part. There's no part of your heart that's immune to that. There's no, in that sense, pure motives. Your whole heart is fallen. This is how God describes it in Genesis 6 before the flood. He declares, Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And listen to the way he says it. That every thought of the intents of his heart were only evil continually. Every thought only evil continually. Every single inclination of the heart. Every single thought of the heart. Only evil all the time. The Holman translation renders that verse this way. Man's wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. Holman makes it about the mind. Both are are true. Your affections, your thoughts are wickedly fallen so that they are only evil all the time. All the time. And that's not just before the flood either. Genesis, I think it's 8 verse 4 or 5 says the same thing. After the ark, they do the sacrifice. And then God says, I'm never going to flood the earth again because every thought of man's heart is only evil. The flood didn't wash away human hearts. You can wash your car. You can wash your hands. You cannot wash your heart. Jeremiah 13 says it this way. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can a leopard change his spots? If so, you might be able to do what is good. Notice Jeremiah's language there. Can you picture a leopard looking in the mirror and saying, I'd like to move this spot over here. Yeah, move those spots around. A leopard can't do that. If you found a leopard that could do that, then you could find a person that could learn to do good. You can't fix your own heart disease. You're fallen into sin and you cannot change it. John 3, verse 19, Jesus' words, this then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. The person Jesus Christ came into the world was rejected because people love sin and they can't help it. That's our lot in life. We're fallen into sin. We are to blame for it because it's who we are and we love it. We've lost ourselves in the love of this world. In the tribulation, you'll see what that looks like with the Antichrist on this planet. The only reason we're not all worshiping the Antichrist now is because we don't know who he is. In the tribulation, they'll see him and they will bow before him and they will worship the devil through him. That's the black background that makes the light of the gospel necessary that people are deceived, what, are, are, are depraved. That's what requires it. Second, the election that allows it the election that allows it or predestination. And you see this in the second part of the verse. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. That's our exception cause. So you see everyone on the earth is worshiping the Antichrist except for this subset of people over here. There's one subset of people of all the people on the earth worshiping the Antichrist. There's a subset of people over here that are not worshiping the Antichrist. So the question is, why do these people not worship what these people worship? There's only one answer. Because these people have their names written in a book. That's the only difference between them. That's the causal difference between them, you could say. There's other, uh, you know, secondary differences. There's other things that will affect how they worship and who they are. But the causal difference, the difference that John identifies, is that these people have their names written in a book that the rest of the world that is, is fallen into sin and depravity does not have their names written in that book. That's the difference. This is called election or, or predestination. That These people named in the book have a different destination than those on the earth. God has determined beforehand, before they were born, that they would go to heaven, that they would be reconciled to him, that they would have the language here is eternal life. They would have life. That's what the book is. You find the book, the title of it is eternal life. You open it and it is a list of names. It's not corporate election. God doesn't simply elect nations or counties, or households, he elects individuals by name. He writes their names down, and they're in a book. When does he write these names down? 
before the foundations of the earth. That's an idiom. It can also mean before the foundation of, of time or before the foundation of the world. That's how the New American Standard renders it. It means before anything. Genesis 1-2. Before that, God had this book written. He wrote the names down before he created the earth. Before he spoke the world into existence, he had this book with names in it. There's a lot that's staggering about that. First of all, that God knew your name before he knew the world. Before your parents knew each other, God knew your name. This is what he tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. He tells Jeremiah, you're going to go be a prophet. And Jeremiah says, no, thank you. God tells Jeremiah, before you were formed in the womb, actually before I formed you in the womb, he says, I knew you. I knew you, Jeremiah. It's staggering. Before God makes a person in the womb, he already knows. Who's to know that? Who, who can he know? Who's the object of God knowing? The person does not exist. His soul has not been made. His body has not been made. In fact, in the language here, the earth hasn't been made. Adam and Eve haven't been made. How can God know you? God knows you by name. Before your parents Googled really cool baby names that not everybody has, <laughs> God knew what you were going to be named. He knew you by name before he even made you. And not only did he know you, he wrote your name down in the book of life. If you're a Christian, your name was in this book of life before he made you. He predestined you for heaven. He doesn't write every name down in the book. Not every person is recorded in the book of life. You look at this book, it, it, in fact, the minority of people are. It's the narrow road that leads to salvation. Otherwise, this full phraseology in verse 8 would be switched. He would say everyone's in the book of life except for those who worship the Antichrist. It's switched. Everyone is depraved. Everyone is worshiping the Antichrist except for those who are in this book. It's a smaller subset. God does not save everyone. He does not elect everyone for salvation. It's a smaller group. It's a group whose names are written in the book of life before he even created the world. And you get this the truth taught all over the Bible. The clearest uh, place, I think it's taught Romans 9, where Paul writes that God did this before the twins were born. God selected Jacob. He elected Jacob. He predestined Jacob and not Esau. And he did that before they were born. Before they even wrestled in the womb, he elected Jacob. Before they had done anything good or bad, Romans 9, 11 says, so that God's purpose in election would stand. That's why God does this. He has a purpose in election. So it's demonstrated to the Antichrist, to the devil, and to the world that it is God who saves, not Jacob. It is God who saves, not Esau. It is God who saves, not the devil or the demons. It is God who saves. That's his purpose in election. Ephesians 1, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God predestines people for heaven based on his own free will. He doesn't consult the angels. He doesn't consult you. He doesn't consult anyone except himself. Election is based on God's own free will. He writes the names in the book. You can't sign, those in the tribulation can't sign up for this. You can go to a kiosk in the mall during the tribulation and say, I would like to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let me submit the form in triplicate. Can you add my name to the book? There, you don't write your own name in it. God does this before you are born based on his own free will. And listen, what's encouraging about that? No name can come out of it. The Antichrist doesn't have an eraser that can touch this book. Even in heaven, remember how chapter 13 started with the Antichrist in heaven hurling accusations and blasphemies against the raptured church, telling God, how dare you save these people? Don't you know how evil they are? And remember what God did to the devil? Threw him out. You can't bring a charge against God's elect. Nothing can take your name out of the book of life. Height can't do it. Depth can't do it. Angels can't do it. Principalities can't do it. Hunger, famine, the sword can't do it. Nothing can do it. Because the election and calling of God are certain and secure. God's word is more solid and more secure than the law of the Medes and Persians. Nothing can undo it. If God elects or predestines a soul, it's as good as finished. So in the future, People will be saved, not based upon their own works, not based upon their own deeds, but based upon the elective power of God. 
Uh, a quick note about election here, it's one directional. God is electing people whom he will save. He is not electing people for damnation. He's predestining people for heaven. He's not predestining people for hell. The scripture describes salvation as being based on the elective work of God, on being in the book of life, and it describes hell being based upon the book of works. People don't go to hell because they were predestined for it. They go to hell because of their deeds, which is the opposite of how you go to heaven. You go to heaven because of God's will. You go to hell because of your own. This is what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.9, speaking about the Antichrist. He says the Antichrist is coming to the world. He's going to work in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. And listen, now he's going to say why they perish. Because they did not love the truth so as to be saved. It's the opposite when it comes to believers. We will be saved because God chose us. He wrote our names before the foundation of the world in the book of life. Thirdly, the substitution that achieves it. The substitution that achieves it. Notice what the subtitle of this book is. The Lamb who has been slain. Eternal life for all the names in it based upon the work of the Lamb that has been slain. This is called atonement. That the second member of the Trinity will come to earth, lead a sinless life as a man in human flesh, die on the cross as a substitution for our sins. He is the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they would sacrifice a lamb for sins, not because the lamb did anything wrong, but it was a substitutionary work. And the firstborn of every household would die. This is the song of, of Moses we sang earlier. The firstborn of every household will die unless the lamb dies in his place and the blood is smeared on the doorpost. The lamb is a substitutionary death. The lamb in that sense bears the sin of the household. But the lamb can't really bear the sin of the household because the lamb's not a person. It can be an atonement for sin. It can be a sacrifice for sin, but it cannot change the heart and it cannot permanently take away sin. It can't do that. That falls to the lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. That falls to the perfect lamb, the man, Jesus Christ. This is why John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, declares, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb comes as the sacrifice. He makes atonement like the animals could not. Now notice when this plan was conceived by God. Again, before the foundations of the world. God chose whom he would save and he did not simply, God didn't do this halfway, okay? When he chose before the foundations of the world who to save, he also chose how to save them. He didn't just write the names down and then roll the dice and say, let's see what happens. Let's see how this whole thing turns out. This will be fun to watch. It's not a reality TV show. He chose who to save and he chose the means by which he would save them, namely the death of the lamb. The cross has always been plan A. The cross was never plan B. When the devil entered the garden, of course it was with the knowledge of God because the death of Christ on the cross to reconcile sinful man to fallen God glorifies God more than anything else in creation. Glorifies God more than if the devil had never gone to the garden. This is God's plan. He sends his son to die for the names in his book. Notice how they're tied together. The names are written in the book of life of the lamb who's been slain. Those names are his. And when he dies on the cross, he dies for every single one of their sins. He dies for the sins you committed before. He dies for the sins that you will commit. He dies for the sins that you committed today. There's no sin that one of these people who's written in the book can commit that the lamb didn't die for, including, and this is very important, including the sin of non-belief. That's a sin. And he died for it, paid the penalty for it on the cross. He dies for every sin that those people in the book can ever commit. Some of you feel like maybe you've, you've sinned too much. I hope every one of you feels like that. <laughs> Some of you might have your thoughts hung on a specific sin, like, oh, there's no way Jesus could die for that kind of sin. I remember walking through the worship center when they were redoing it and there was the stairs over there or the, that part of the stage over there wasn't yet carpeted. And I asked the worker, where's, where's the carpet on that part of the stage? And he says, oh, it's, you know, we'll bring it. More carpet tomorrow, don't worry. Well, it's carpeted now, right? <laughs> it's how your sins are. You might look at it and say, hey, there's not, there's not enough of the death of Christ to cover this. There's not, we ran out of, he ran out of blood. He ran out of sacrifice. He ran out of substitution before he covered that sin. Hey, there's more coming tomorrow, <laughs> 
He covers every one of your sins. So much so that he can say that your salvation is accomplished. It's finished. On the cross, to Telestai was his cry. It is done. Your sins were atoned for and forgiven by God when Jesus died on the cross in your place. It is over, over. And you might think, what then of the first half of my life? When I was born, lived my life without salvation, lived my life running from God. Lived my life fully depraved, rejecting the gospel. Now I'm a Christian. How could you say that my salvation was accomplished for the first half of my life if I spent that first half of my life running from God? Do you understand the question? This is how the fourth point answers it. The illumination that brings it. The illumination that brings it, or it's also called regeneration would be the theological term. The illumination that brings your salvation to you. That God makes you alive. He gives you new spiritual life. And that's the, what you see here in verse nine. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And that's a very strange, it's a proverbial sounding kind of statement. It's an idiom tucked here in here in the middle of the whole chapter about the two beasts from the sea and the Antichrist ruling the world. And you get this little proverb thrown in here. It's very easy just to skip over it. But if you did that, you would miss the point of what John's trying to give you here. This is a proverb that's taking you back to why Jesus spoke in parables. Why Jesus spoke in parables. Jesus did not speak in parables to reveal truth to the whole world. I've heard people say, you know, you should, you should speak in stories because Jesus spoke in stories. It's the most effective way of communicating. No, <laughs> it's not. In fact, Jesus didn't speak in parables since the last year of his ministry. And he did that as a form of judgment on the people. The crowds were around for his teaching. They didn't hear his teaching. They didn't want to follow him for his teaching. They wanted to follow him for his miracles. And so to judge them, he began speaking to them in parables. After he spoke his first parable to him, the disciples came to him. This is Mark chapter four. Disciples came to him and said, oh, we noticed something today. Um, this is different. You're speaking in parables. We don't know what you're talking about. Help. And Jesus says, Mark four, verse 11, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside will get everything in parables. Those who are inside, who have faith, you'll understand what he's talking about. But those who are outside, they'll just hear stories. They won't get it. So that, verse 12, Mark 4, 12, while seeing they may see and not perceive. While hearing they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven, Jesus says. I'm going to talk to them in parables because they do not have ears to hear and I don't want them to hear. That's the phrase that John tucks in right here. That there are those who do not have spiritual ears to hear. They do not have spiritual eyes to see. Have you ever wondered why if Revelation has all this prophecy that is so precise and specific and the Antichrist comes, why don't people, why aren't they watching the news like, this is what it, ah! <laughs> this is what it says. <laughs> don't you understand? Because they don't have ears to hear. They don't see it. Even the verse we just read, the names written in the book of life from the, for the foundations of the earth of the lamb that was slain. Those who aren't saved, that sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher to them. The book of life? I'm alive. Before the foundations of time, how do you write a book before you made the world? Of those who, lamb? Who's the lamb? Bah. Non-Christians don't understand. <laughs> They don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. They couldn't understand Jesus' parables and they don't understand the prophecy in the book of Revelation. That's the point. But to those who have an ear, they can hear. How do you get an ear? The Lord gives it to you. You're spiritually dead throughout your life. You're born into this world, loving sin and running from God. You resist the will of God. You resist the work of the spirit. You run from God your entire life until some point where you don't, where the Holy Spirit changes your heart. To use the language of John chapter three, you're born again. You turn from sin and you place your faith in the, the, the death of Christ in your place. And you have new eyes and you have new ears and you have new life. That's what regeneration is, new life. You go from death to life, blindness to sight. You can see and you can hear the truths of scripture. Now, you don't see and hear everything perfectly. 
At the moment of conversion, you don't understand all the parables. At the moment of conversion, you don't understand all the prophecy. You don't understand all the truths of scripture. No, it's work. And you're gonna work on it your entire life, but you go from blindness to sight. You can start to see. You have to learn how to speak still. It's like you're looking in a mirror, but dimly because of our sin, because we're in a fallen world. When we're in heaven, we'll see face to face. Now it's through a mirror and dimly. That's what it is, but you still have eyes and you can see. That's this language here. That everybody in the world is sinful and running from God. That God writes down some names of those whom he will save before they're even born. He sends his son, the lamb of God, who dies on the cross to forgive them of their sins. And then at some point in time during their life, your salvation was already accomplished on the cross. You don't know that at this point, but it already was. And then God changes you. His Holy Spirit brings you to life. Something happens to you. That's the new birth. He gives you ears and he opens your eyes and the scales fall off your eyes and you can see. You can see because you have spiritual life. Listen, salvation is something that happens to you. It's supernatural. It's not something you do. It's something that happens to you and then you can hear. Jesus uses this phrase five times, Mark 4, 9, 423, 716, 411, if you're curious. Well, this is why some people don't see because they're not alive. They don't have eyes, they don't have ears. But for those of us with eyes and with ears and with spiritual life, that brings us to our fifth point, the sovereignty that keeps it. The sovereignty that keeps it. You see the gospel's power through the depravity that demands it or requires it, through the predestination that allows it, through the atonement that achieves it, through the regeneration that brings it, and through the perseverance that keeps it that keeps it. You could even call this the perseverance of the saints because that's what John does. Here is the perseverance of the saints, he says in verse 10. But notice the phrase that he leads into this with. It's a very, it is a strange, in the category of strange Old Testament verses to use here in the New Testament, this one probably wins the prize. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Now this verse is from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, and the context there is, I think, helpful for us. You don't need to flip there, but to describe it, God told Jeremiah, remember we talked about this earlier, Jeremiah 1, I'm going to make you a prophet. Jeremiah says, no thanks. God says, I overrule you. My vote counts twice as yours. Yes. (laughs) So Jeremiah starts prophesying. People don't listen. Jeremiah tells him to leave Jerusalem because it's going down. The people don't listen. Jeremiah 15, God tells Jeremiah, listen, the Babylonians are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. Tell them to get out of there. And then he says this, Jeremiah 15, verse 1, Yahweh said to me, though Moses and Samuel would stand before me, my heart wouldn't turn towards these people. Because Jeremiah was praying for the people of Jerusalem. And God says, stop it. I don't want to hear prayers for them. If Moses or Samuel were to pray for them, I wouldn't hear it, Jeremiah. And you're no Moses or Samuel. (laughs) Poor Jeremiah. (laughs) Send them out of my sight, God says, let them go. And when they ask you, where are we supposed to go? This is what you tell them, Jeremiah. And this is Jeremiah 15, verse 2. Those who are destined for pestilence will go to pestilence. Those who are destined for the sword to the sword. Those who are destined for famine to famine. Those for captivity to captivity. I will give them four destroyers, declares Yahweh. The sword to kill, the dogs to tear, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. They're going to go to four places. They'll die by a sword. They'll die by dogs. They'll be devoured by birds or destroyed by beasts. Those are the four options they have. And listen, I already chose which one they each get. (laughs) Encourage them with those words, Jeremiah. (laughs) Captivity and death have always been a reality for God's people on the earth. In the Old Testament, they didn't have faith and they were being delivered to it. This is the verse that John uses here at this point in the New Testament to describe the lot of believers on the earth during the terror of the Antichrist. And to put it in the context of the Babylonian captivity, these are non-believers. They did not fear Yahweh and God was sending them in captivity. In the New Testament, Revelation 13, these people are saved. Their names are in the book of life. They do have ears to hear. They have been converted. And John tells them, if you're gonna go to captivity, you're gonna go to captivity. If you're gonna die with a sword, you'll die with the sword. In other words, God has already chosen your death. It's already been destined, is the word, by God, how you're going to die. Where are they supposed to go? Just like the Israelites during Jeremiah's day, where are we supposed to go? What country do you want us to go to? Was their rhetorical question. They never did actually ask that question, by the way, but 
when the Antichrist is ruling the world, where are you going to go to hide from him? Where can you hide? Are you supposed to get off the earth? Where can you go? You can't go anywhere. You will die. Christians will die during that time. They will die. The number of the martyrs will be fulfilled. The martyrs are begging in heaven for vengeance for their blood. This is that time that these people are being slain. And John encourages them by reminding them that God has already chosen the death they will die. How's that encouraging? Because the Antichrist can torture them, arrest them, and kill them, but he cannot take their salvation away. It doesn't matter what he does to them, they will not lose their salvation. It's more than just not losing. I don't even like saying it in the negative. I, you know, I don't lose my car keys anymore. I have a hook. I always put them on. I used to always lose them. I have a hook. They always go in the same spot. I'm not going to lose them. I know where they are. That's not true with your salvation. It's not just, I know where it is. I'm not going to lose it. No, you will actually persevere. It's more than just not losing it. You will keep on keeping on. You will keep on pushing through. You will hold on to your faith. Come antichrist, come beasts, come devils, come demons. Nothing can take your faith away from you. No one can take your faith away from you. You will persevere. That's the encouragement. They can throw you in jail. If so, God already chose it for you. Notice the irony here. People whose names are written in the book of life will die a martyr's death. But they will still have eternal life. They will still have eternal life. God planned this from before the foundation of time. He implemented it in time and he will keep it in the future. I mean, if you notice the verb tenses in 8 through 10, they're all over the map here. Those who will dwell on the earth in future will worship in the future. Everyone past tense before the earth was made, whose names had their book in the, written in the book of life, who has been slain past tense. If you have an ear present tense to hear, let him hear. If you, and there's the verb is missing there, it's implied. If you were destined for captivity in the past, you will go to captivity in the future. Here is present tense, the perseverance of the saints. It's all over the timeline here. People are depraved. God has chosen in the past to save some, he will save them in time and they will never lose their salvation. The Antichrist can't take it from you. He can't harm you spiritually. He can't do it. And that's why this is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. They will hold on to their faith through all of this. John says it this way, 1 John 4, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is that, sorry, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, he says. And it's already in the world. You've heard it's coming. It's in the world already, John says. Right now, it's in the world. In human hearts that don't worship Jesus, they have love for the Antichrist already. Little children, you are from God. And notice John's verb tense change here. You've already overcome them. You've already overcome them. You overcame the spirit of Antichrist when Jesus died on the cross, when his spirit sealed your heart. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Lord, we're thankful that you and your spirit are stronger than the spirit of sin, stronger than the power of the devil and of the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is indeed already in the world. It's at work in the hearts of those those who don't recognize Christ. And Lord, such were some of us. Our hearts are sinful in the same way. We're thankful that you've given us your spirit, which dwells in us, and stronger is your spirit than any spirits of the world. So Lord, we're thankful that our salvation is secure. No threat can take it away from us. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who has never given their life to Christ. They've never repented of their sins. They've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ's death on the cross. I pray that they would do that this morning, that your spirit would work in their hearts, that you would cause them to feel convicted about their sins, that they would feel guilty for their sins, they'd recognize that they're a sinner, yet they would feel joy that you've made a way to escape judgment by dying on the cross for their sins. I pray that you would save people through the words here of Revelation 13, even this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, 
please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.